right, I'm back with a new video. Uh, this time we are circling back to Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, which is a game with an absurdly long title that I hate writing in headlines because it takes up half the headline space. Um, a new development this week was that we got some impressions from journalists and content creators, YouTubers, about uh, a section of hours from the game. Did not go to this thing because you would have had to gone to LA for that, which I'm not going to do. I don't care that much. And <laughs> results came back and were kind of mixed. Um, most of like the, the gaming gaming outlets, like the websites, did not really love it. Uh, most famously, the IGN uh, preview by Dustin Legary was pretty negative overall. And as such, uh, it is being picked apart by everybody. Um, and it's the usual IGN doesn't know what they're talking about. And Dustin is debating people on Twitter. Dustin's my friend. I'll probably talk with him uh, about this tomorrow on a little show we do. And uh, otherwise, some of the YouTubers were were more positive about it. Um, but regardless, there is not exactly a sense of, of glowing praise coming out of this thing. And at best, you're kind of hearing like, this part was fun. It has potential, stuff like this. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is like unanswered questions, like repetitive fights and things like that. And it is a little unusual, I would say, to see a preview event like this uh, produce kind of uniformly negative headlines because the way this works is if you have an event like this, you're generally feeling pretty confident. And also in an event like this, you are um, sectioning off a specific part of your game that you think is going to be the most appealing because you want the previews to say, oh, hey, this is really good you know, from the small test. I do know one of the com uh, complicating factors here is that there were a bunch of technical problems with the test. Like they, there was footage lost and like, uh, you know, things breaking and stuff for at least half of the, the test session. And the other issue with doing a play test for, or a play test preview for a live service game is that you are pretty limited to, you know, a slice of it. Like it, it reminds me of like what you would, maybe think of destiny if you were thrown into the game you know for moment one with a bunch of green and blue gear and then later you're transported into you know being max level with all the exotics and stuff and suddenly you're having to like figure out what your build is and like how this feels and like it's pretty chaotic to try and test something like that and have it accurately uh you know produce a coherent impression which is why I don't know if it's a good idea in the first place to even have a preview event like this, um, especially for traditional press. And like I would consider myself among that, even with my YouTube here. Uh, it just doesn't really lend itself for that type of preview. I think YouTubers are a little more used to you know this kind of process and giving games some time and live service more generally. Um, I also think. Yeah, this is a little bit of a generalization, but I do think game journalists, myself included, are a little more cynical <laughs> about these things where YouTubers are a little bit more optimistic. Um, a lot of game journalism, like when you cover something, you might give it, you know, a, a score that you're assigned to give it or not. Sorry, <laughs> let me rephrase that. You are assigned to give a game a score. <laughs> Don't clip that. I swear to God, you are assigned to give a game a score. It doesn't sound great either. You are assigned to review a game and you have to give it a score. And when you do that, it becomes like kind of a snapshot and a moment in time where that's what you submit to Metacritic. That is the end of it. Um, and for live service games, which grow and evolve over time, there are often not the resources to devote those to those games to see how they're kind of evolving as time goes on. And the idea of re-reviewing a live service game is something that rarely happens. And with Metacritic, you can't change your original score anyway. So you have people ending up, you know, reviewing expansions and things. YouTubers are a lot more flexible where you can, uh, you know, get a new game and then it's kind of up to you whether your channel is going to significantly dive into it or not. You get in more of these <clears throat> cycles where a uh, YouTuber, Twitch streamer, whatever, will pick up a new game and then sort of play it as, as much as they can and, you know, for as long as they can, as long as it still keeps getting views and, and interest. And if that game ends up blowing up, that's a really good thing. And you could be riding that wave. If that game does not go anywhere, uh, you are out of luck. And it hurts you, I think, more as a YouTuber 
when a game you're devoting a lot of time, a lot of videos and stuff into fails, as opposed to, you know, IGN or something having to cover a game a handful of times after, you know, over a handful of writers, uh, it's just a little bit of a different situation. So I'm just trying to pitch the, you know, uh, cynicism versus optimism divide and, and try and explain why it might be the way it is. This is a little bit philosophical, but with Suicide Squad in particular, it's a very strange situation. I read about the, the marketing for this today because there's another group of people that played the game in a closed alpha state, which I would argue is probably a better way to preview it in general than some sort of five hour test or, or whatever they could run. A closed alpha, um, I, I don't think it was, the, I think it was different content, like some, some overlap, but the idea there is like you just sort of let people uh, let loose and experiment themselves. It's not as structured, like you are contained to a certain part of the game, but it's a little more free flowing. And the weird thing is like all I ever heard on the closed alpha, maybe not all, but a good majority of what I heard was that uh, the game was actually fun and it actually convinced a lot of people to give it a try or even pre-order it and stuff like that. And Rocksteady has kept them all under NDA. <laughs> like even They're not even supposed to say they like it. That is technically breaking their NDA. And Lord knows if they say they don't like it, that is super breaking the NDA because that's the stuff they will get even more mad about. But like no one can really go into specifics in like these thousands of people that were in the closed alpha cannot detail their impressions. Whereas we just had a handful of game journalists and YouTubers able to do previews when they probably played less than a lot of the closed alpha players, which is very bizarre. Um it seems really strange to me to hold all those people people under an NDA. It seems equally strange that if the entire pushback to your game is that it looks too chaotic, like it the UI is not good, the gameplay is so different than Arkham, and people are really concerned about it and how it plays with all the characters have guns, which is weird as opposed to you know their own kits with boomerangs and whatever, uh, and you know it's co-op and the way to alleviate those complaints is if you do an open beta and people can get the game in their own hands and try it out for themselves. And suddenly, if it is true, if you did get all the movement uh, right and the combat right, and it does feel good to play, many of the concerns about live service stuff may go away, at least for launch. But they have not done that. They have kept all the people who probably played the game the most under a uh, NDA, and they did this preview event that was technically broken uh, among a very scarce handful of people, um, and that is the thing that can be publicly released. Not a great idea, if you ask me, um, and it's created this really, I don't know, weird situation where now everyone's attacking the, attacking the journalists that previewed the game, and I'm seeing like a couple even devs like going after the previews and like the videos that got posted, and like they're they're doing this whole, not Rock City devs, but like devs in general, doing this whole, like, can any game journalist play a game? Like, which is, that's a garbage narrative that I hate because there's like a handful of cases among every game journalist that has ever played a video game where it's like the guy who couldn't beat the Cuphead tutorial and that suddenly means all game journalists are terrible at games. Uh, in this case, it's funny because some of the what the footage they're critiquing was footage provided by Rock City, which is not actually the people playing. Um so there, there's a lot of prejudgment going on here on both sides, but I think it is not illogical to be very skeptical of the game and its core concept. As I've said many, many times, we have seen so many storied single player developers go on to make live service games that may have even been good, but were not great enough to justify their existence or avoid being considered a failure. Obvious ones being Anthem, Marvel's Avengers. And this game specifically is very much Marvel's Avengers. Like, it is the almost the exact same model that was pitched for that game. Um, it has less heroes at launch, but it is doing the thing where it adds free heroes over time, adds new missions and content over time. The main difference is that it has an open world city as opposed to these little cordoned off zones, but the model is the same. So in order to prove itself, it really, really has to, you know, can't you can't just like have players forced to be given the benefit of the doubt ahead of something like this. You really have to convince them it's going to be something that's worth their time. And I I really do think the only way they could have done that is with a public beta. Because given the alpha feedback, if if people get their hands on this in a more kind of open context, that's what you, you know, sort of head into the game thinking. And then if it is a majority of people liking how it feels 
at the very least, you know, it, that creates a narrative around the game going into launch. Instead, if you have a dozen previews, half of which are kind of negative, the other half of which are like, maybe it's okay, that's definitely not what you want to see. And we are three weeks away from launch here now, so like, it's too late. Like, you're not going to do a beta now, but like, the way this has been handled from, you know, pretty much a, for the past year has been pretty nuts. And I still do not have a great feeling about this game. The feeling I have is not necessarily that the game is going to be outrageously bad in any particular way. I think combat could be very fun. You know what combat was pretty fun in? Avengers. They all they did a really good job with those character kits. They genuinely crafted at least the base six, you know, seven characters, really utilizing all their different superhero skills and abilities, and like they did make some really fun combat with that experience. But you you can't just be like good in this genre. If you want to sustain a live service, you need a critical mass of players who don't just, you know, maybe enjoy the base campaign. You need to keep them hooked and engaged for such a long period of time, which is why we almost never see this work in the PvE space, which even there were elements of both, you know, Avengers and Anthem that were really good at baseline. Like we Anthem is almost like nostalgic at this point and people are like oh I wish Anthem could have persevered and it's like yeah well you didn't think that when no one was playing it and the game was slowly dying like it but it's true it did do a lot of things very well and yet it was not enough to save it so like if this is like okay and it's like okay this isn't a disaster this isn't Redfall or whatever like that is a a not really high enough bar to set because a game like this you probably already have at least a year of post-launch content planned out if not two years and like that doesn't mean it's all in development but it does mean that you are going to need to hold players attention for long long after um, the initial game ends and one of the biggest problems we've seen with this is actually meeting live service deadlines where people aren't just going to put your game down and put it and and never come back to it and like Destiny struggled with this at the beginning. There were these really long gaps in between, you know, that they were still doing DLC. It was like kind of live, but not really back then. But a common thread between Avengers and Anthem is that they made these development roadmaps and then missed everything. They missed everything for months. And like both of those games had a lot of core problems that they had to fix within the game itself before they could even think about starting to work on like bonus characters or additional missions or, or things like that. And half the time it took six months, a year, like more than that, like to really get everything fixed. So a lot of that does depend on how Suicide Squad launches. It already had a nine month delay out of last spring. So hopefully that was enough time to really get it into shape. If it launches like without needing all that much, you know, extra patching and, and quality of life stuff and balancing and whatever. And if they can go straight into their planned content thing and release that content on a regular like on a regular basis that would at least be a very good start that's not to say that the concept is automatically going to hook people but delivering content in a timely fashion consistently is at least a good way to get started and if you don't do that if you need you know 6 months or something to get out your first season it's it's going to be a lot tougher and if you keep extending the gap between say new characters like oh there's going to be one every three months and like, eh, maybe one every six months. And like, okay, we'll do one this year. Like it, it really does depend like kind of what you have in the bag already and what you need to do after the game launches. Uh, it's hard. It's incredibly hard to make, especially PVE content consistently at this scale. Like very few games have been able to pull this off. The highest profile examples are um, probably in, in the live service traditional space, like Destiny and Genshin Impact. And then like, MMOs like Final Fantasy 14 adding new content and stuff like that. But it is it is incredibly hard to pump out that pace of content and I would argue especially hard for these single player studios that have never had to do that before. Like BioWare, you know, was an incredibly talented studio. Like Crystal Dynamics did a great job with their new Tomb, Tomb Raider trilogy. But it doesn't, you know, Rocksteady with 3 Arkham games it just, it doesn't necessarily translate. And I know they're talented, and I'm sure there are definitely some aspects of, of that carried into Suicide Squad, but it's not even just about making the base gameplay fun. It's about 
can you deliver content like that on a regular basis? And that is sort of the open question. I'm not going to say they, they can't do that. It's impossible because we don't know yet. I just know that we have seen many, many examples of people not being able to do this and the game failing or people not really being able to do this and, you know, fixing it a year or two later, or it takes a long time for them to finally get a uh, handle on it. I would argue Destiny, after a decade, has only recently, in the last few years, you know, started delivering pretty substantial content on the PvE side with each season. And even though they do that, other things fall by the wayside, PvP, Gambit, stuff like that. So even then, it's it's never really enough for players. So the first step is hooking players with your core gameplay loop story in these games helps. I don't know if it's the highest priority, but you really just want people to be having fun. Second priority is making sure your game launches without needing three, six, nine months of fixes before you can start putting out your uh, live content. And then putting out live content in a way that is regular, that players are able to look at a date on a calendar and be like, okay, this is when this drops in Suicide Squad. I'm going to come back for that. And that date is not six to 12 months away. Uh, and then your kind of on your way if you can combine all these those three things which is ridiculously hard like totally hard then that's you know kind of the foundation for success and maybe they'll just be happy for selling a bunch of copies and if the live service stuff doesn't pan out like great but that is probably not what warner brothers thinks i think warner brothers really really wants live service games to that print money and this has never really felt like that good of an idea or a concept to go that route but here we are, and now we just have to sort of deal with it as it is and see how it goes. Um, I don't know what other promotions are going to do before this. I think they have another direct, which I think is about the live service aspects, which I'm sure that'll go well. Um, and then early access is like really late uh, January. I don't know if I'm getting a review copy or not. I think I'm on a list somewhere, but who knows if that'll pan out. If not, I'll just buy it for early access and play then. I really hope it's good. I, I think, you know, Everybody would rather play a good game than a bad game, so I, I am certainly not rooting for it to fail. I have just seen many games attempt close to this exact same thing and fail. So, yes, there's skepticism. But yeah, thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon. Take care.